By the spring of 1898, tent cities have been erected on the shores of Lake Lindemann and Lake Bennett in Canada's British Columbia. The stampeders of the Klondike will continue facing a long road of challenges standing between them and their dreams for riches. So many thousands of people are willing to leave their homes and their jobs and, and their families uh, behind for the uh, elusive promise of, of riches in a place they had really no concept of what they were getting into. People came to this part of the world to disappear, and you could do that. Get away from the law, bad marriage, the world. A lot of people come to, to Alaska today to get away from that hustle and bustle of, of urbanized Lower 48. After 60 plus trips over the Chilkoot and White Pass trails leading out of the Skagway Dye area, about 40,000 stampeders have successfully transported their ton of goods to Lake Lindemann and Lake Bennett. Bennett represents the headwaters of the Yukon River and the beginning of the water portion of the stampeders' uh, trip to Dawson. Well, they estimate that about 100,000 people started out. You know, people dropped everything to come here and, and um, very few of them made it. The rest of the 100,000 who set out on the trail had either returned home or settled in Skagway. About three months had passed from the time the Stampeders left Seattle and San Francisco until they arrived at the lakes at the head of the Yukon River. It would take you perhaps a week to get up to Skagway. And then it's gonna take you about three months to move all of your equipment over the mountains to Bennett. From there, there was another 500 or so, 550 miles down to Dawson on the Yukon River. It could take you four or five months to get to Dawson because you also had to wait for the Yukon River to unfreeze. While waiting for the Yukon to thaw, it was time for the Stampeders to build a boat to transport not only themselves, but their ton of provisions as well. The Yukon River is actually a very shallow river and uh, very fast current. We're talking about seven knots an hour in the springtime especially. And each of them had a year's supply of food, so they had to make fairly large, large boats. This is one of the most popular of the designs of boats that left here. They packed everything in boats like this, everything from little tiny boats, almost canoe and kayak-like, to larger boats like this, might have a horse or two on it and a whole group of people and all their supplies, up to small steam-powered paddle wheelers that they pulled the components for over the mountain passes. There were several steamboats that were brought over in bits and pieces, you know, with boilers and engines and, and a lot of wood. So if you timed it right, you would be doing this boat building during the winter. In May, usually, is when the ice would go out of the river and you could launch that boat and begin your journey downstream. People that lived in a big tent here when they finished with whatever they were eating that was canned at the time, they just toss it down here and you can see there's a fairly big garbage dump. They used a almost pure lead to seal the cans. People who lived on the canned food for any extended length of time could be poisoned by it. Then it has maybe the most visible remnants of, uh, of the Stampeders being, having been on the Chilkoot Trail. Bennett was at its peak, uh, estimated somewhere in the area of 50,000 people. People had been living a miserable existence in tents scattered all over these mountainsides, building boats so they could float to the gold fields. Many of the Stampeders had absolutely zero carpentry skills. Whip sawing planks of wood to ultimately build a floating craft was completely foreign to them. I've never built a boat with my bare hands out of green logs. I had to saw myself. That sounds pretty, pretty amazing. It depended on your knowledge and ability. Uh, sometimes you hired people to build the boats for you because you just didn't have the knowledge, but you needed other people to help you. Not everybody had the carpentry skills or uh, was willing to whip saw trees into planks to build a boat. They stripped the hillsides a long way up of all the timber. And then they would 
build a uh, scaffolding type of uh, saw pit, basically. It supported the tree, and there was one guy up on the top and one guy at the bottom, and they had this big, huge saw. They sawed the trees into sections, into boards, and then they used those boards to build a boat. It took them several months to do that. Whether standing above or below the law, the work was so difficult that each man believed he was doing all the work. This led to many arguments. And so some people broke their partnerships during the boat building process and would depart. Nobody was fully prepared for the numerous challenges that faced their journey to the Klondike. A lot of people were, were not experienced. They didn't know what to expect, but the draw was just too strong and they couldn't say no. So they went up here not knowing what obstacles they were gonna face, and that cost them dearly. But everyone was convinced that there was gold to be had. For the stampeders that were left, nothing was going to stand between them and the promise of riches. Resembling much of Skagway in its early days, Lake Bennett was a booming tent city, offering all the amenities of an established town. Bennett was a bustling gold rush town, like a lot of gold rush towns that happened through various gold rushes from San Francisco to Colorado. There was always that, that great hope that people had that they were starting something new and that it was gonna be there a long time. It was reported by a scout of the Northwest Mounted Police that 778 boats were being built at Lake Lindemann, 850 at Lake Bennett, and another 198 at Carcross. Caribou Crossing, as it was formerly known, uh, because of the large caribou herds that pass through this region. Within three weeks after this report, another 1,200 boats were built. Like worked up thoroughbreds at the gate of the Kentucky Derby, the Stampeders were anxiously awaiting the spring thaw so they could begin the race to the Klondike. Some folks uh, actually were pretty enterprising about it. They slitted their whole outfit as far down the river as they could, and once the ice broke, they just kept going. An armada of nearly 7,000 ships quickly swept through the glassy waters, chasing their dreams for riches. Lake Bennett immediately became the lonely place it once was only a few short months prior. And of course, afterwards, the city would become a ghost town. People would leave, they just came for whatever economic gold strike, and then they'd leave, and then the, the city would be left kind of like abandoned. It, it lasted really only three years until the train was completed to Bennett in 1899, which basically made Bennett and the Chilkoot Trail obsolete. Everything you see here that has grown back naturally reforested itself since 1898. This is just Mother Nature working to reclaim a site that was really worked over 100 years plus ago. By 1902, except for the old log church on the hillside and a few other buildings, Bennett was virtually gone. 